tent. In the gray light of dawn, I woke to the sound of voices in the kitchen. Mom was serving coffee to the volunteers who had brought donuts and Danish pastries and sticky buns. The whole house smelled like sugar, but I had no appetite for any of it. Mom gave me a cup of hot chocolate. Drink it, she said. It's cold outside. Take some donuts or something. She was pale, her eyes red and puffy from crying. and She was smoking. A woman from the realtor's office told her to go back to bed. She looked terrible, but mom insisted she was fine. We're going to find Erica today, she said. To please mom, I took a donut and went outside. The police were talking to a bunch of people I didn't know, telling them what was expected of them. Form lines, walk an arm's length apart, examine every inch of ground. If you see anything that may be connected with Erica, stop and call a policeman. Do not move it. Do not touch it. Leave it in situ and wait for a policeman. I edged away toward the woods. No one noticed me go. I had a crazy idea I could find Erica myself, be a hero, make up for leaving the doll and all that it had led to. In the clearing where I'd last seen my sister, a crow perched in the dead tree. He cocked his head at me, cawed, and flew away. I sat down on the log and tried to think about where Erica might have gone. I sat there for a while, but no ideas came to me. I stood up and called her again and again until my voice was as hoarse and raspy as a crow's. Her name rang in the air, bounced from tree to tree, echoed back to me, but she didn't answer. Nor did she come running out of the woods, her red curls in a tangle, her parka muddy, breathless, cold, hungry, elated to see me, Daniel, a rescuer. You won't find her that way. I spun around, startled to see Brody standing a few feet away. He wore a ratty fringed suede jacket that looked as if it had once belonged to his mother. His bony knees stuck out of holes in his jeans and his hair straggled over his eyes. What are you doing here? I asked him. My dad's in the search party, so I thought I'd come along over and see what's going on. I heard you calling your sister's name. I doubt she'll hear you, no matter how loud you yell. She might hear me. Nobody knows how far away she is. She could be trying to find her way home right now. She could have fallen into a hole or something. He edged closer to me, shuffling through leaves as he came. Listen, he said in a low voice. There's stuff about this place you don't know. Stuff nobody's told you. Mainly because you're such a stuck-up snot. I stared at him suspiciously. His nose was running and his eyes had a moist pink look. If I was such a stuck-up snot, what did he want with me? Why was he here? What kind of stuff? I found myself lowering my voice too. He shrugged and took a quick look around. His eyes lingered on the dead tree. You know what happened to Celine Estes, right? You told me about her. Remember, on the bus, the first day I came to school? Brody was almost whispering now. He kept looking at the dead tree. Well, folks are saying your sister's been took, just like Celine was, and you won't ever see her again. Took. There was that word again. How had Erica picked it up? Don't be so stupid, Brody. Celine disappeared more than 50 years ago. Whoever took her is dead by now, and so is Celine. Maybe, Brody said. Maybe not. Next you'll be telling me Bloody Bones took her. Nah, old auntie's got her. Ask anybody in Woodville, they'll tell you. Old auntie lived a long time ago, I said. She's definitely dead. If she even existed, which I doubt. Brody shook his head. She lives way back in the woods, up on Brewster's Hill. Every now and then, somebody sees her at night, walking along the highway, collecting dead things, her and bloody bones. That's what they eat. Roadkill. I don't believe you. You want me to take you to her cabin? Brody asked, his eyes still boring into mine. That's where everybody thinks she kept Celine. Maybe that's where your sister's at. I know where it is. I've been there with Dad and Erica. It's an old falling down ruin. Nobody lives in it. In the daytime, yeah. But at night, it looks like it used to. That's crazy. 
I said. I'm going up there, he said. You can come if you like, or not. Makes no matter to me what you do. He turned and started walking away. I followed him, the fringe on his jacket blue in the wind. The little beads sewed to it rattled and bumped together. What do you mean at night it's like it used to be? I asked him. I mean, he said slowly, without bothering to look at me, that it looks like it did when old auntie was alive. You just told me she's alive. Now you're saying she's dead? No. What I'm saying is old auntie's a haunt. Come back from her grave. I grabbed Brody's arm and made him stop and look at me. Do you expect me to believe that? He shrugged. Believe what you like. He turned his back again. But I wasn't through with him. This is what I think, I said. You're dragging me up here to play some kind of trick on me which is really awful because my sister is missing and the whole town is looking for her and you're taking advantage of that to get me to go with you. I bet your friends are already up there, getting ready to scare me or something. What kind of kid are you? Brody backed away from me. I'm not up to anything. I want to help you find your sister, that's all. We had reached the steep part of the trail. The trees had thinned out and the wind was blowing hard enough to knock me over the edge of the hill. Ghosts, monsters, places that are ruins in the daytime, but not after dark, I said. It's all stupid lies, fairy tales. I'm going back to the house. Maybe they found my sister. We're almost there, Brody said. At least take a look. I hesitated, stuck between climbing downhill and climbing uphill. I'd come this far. Why not go a little farther? What if Erica really was there? <laughs>